，融聚智慧，方能融创价值。融你我，融无限。江苏银行。的六月底呢，中国的海滨城市大连却依旧能够让人感受到凉爽之意。而今年呢，这里也再次成为了夏季达沃斯论坛举办的主场。论坛呢，以在第四次工业革命中实现包容性增长为主题，有来自全球八十多个国家和地区的两千余位嘉宾，围绕着推广以人为本的技术，引领持续再创造、创造可持续系统、应对地缘经济变化等等四个议题，展开了两百多场会议讨论。那么，作为每年重量级的官方议程之一呢，由财新传媒与世界经济论坛联合主办的财新电视辩论“一带一路”全球影响在二十八号拉开了帷幕。辩论呢是由财新传媒的执行总编辑王硕来主持的，邀请到了亚洲基础设施投资银行的副行长亚历山德、国际货币基金组织的副总裁张涛、新加坡贸工部的高级政务部长沈颖、巴基斯坦规划与发展部部长伊克巴尔、UPS 中国区总裁彼得斯。分别呢是从国际组织、沿线国家政府以及企业界的视角出发，就“一带一路”计划的全球的合作前景展开了讨论。We know that the key to the Belt and Road Initiative is connectivity. Connectivity along multiple dimensions among participating countries, including policy coordination, facilities connectivity, unimpeded trade. Financial integration and the people-to-people -people bond. It's a beautiful and ambitious vision, especially at a time when the whole world seems to be sliding into more fragmentations. So the question is, what regional and global partnership are required to realize a successful and inclusive One Belt One Road initiative? So consider of your reply to this question as your opening statement. How about we start from the two ministers from the Belt Road countries? Uh, Minister Iqbal, please go ahead first. Then Minister Singh. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me say that One Belt, One Road uh, vision is a very powerful vision in today's world because we see that after it, to 10 years of the depression and the global crisis, the developed economies are still struggling to uh, find growth path. And there is a slowdown in the global economy, and the demand is low. So if we have to go to the higher growth platform, we need more demand. Now, demand will only come from the markets. So if the markets are saturated, we need new markets. To go to new markets, we need connectivity. So this is a very powerful concept where through uh, connectivity, we connect people, markets, produce new demand, and that leads to new growth. And in the process, it touches the lives of millions of people who are cut off from the mainstream of development. And that is what makes it very inclusive. In Pakistan, we started this journey in 2013 with signing of China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. MOU under One Belt, One Road. And within two years, it has translated into a portfolio of about $50 billion. And what we are witnessing is that it has brought billions of dollars of investment in the poorest and the remotest areas of Pakistan, where it is making a big difference in the lives of the people. It has provided them connectivity through better road network, opened up areas. The hinterland is connected to the coastal areas. It is also touching their lives through socio-economic development projects. Uh, there is a new fiber optic cable that is giving digital connectivity to the remotest areas. Uh, and also, it has enabled billions of dollars of investment in energy. Uh, that has enabled the economy to achieve highest growth rate in the last 10 years. So we believe that such uh, uh, ventures of collaboration offer opportunity not for a single country, but for the whole region. Thank you. Mr. Singh. The Belt and Road is 
indeed a mutually beneficial initiative that we think is going to bring about many benefits through regional economic integration. Let me talk about ASEAN, uh, which is the region that Singapore is in. And uh, within ASEAN, there is uh, a lot of uh, optimism for growth. There are very good prospects for growth. At the moment, there are about 67 million households termed by McKinsey as being within the consuming class uh, in ASEAN. And this number is set to almost double by 2025 to 125 million. This represents tremendous opportunities. This represents a lot of potential for connectivity, for more ideas, for growth. And I think that some of the very uh, exciting partnerships that's going to come out from Belt and Road will center around connectivity, it will center around um, finance and infrastructure, and it may also center around working together, Belt and Road countries working together to enter into third markets. And in the case of Singapore, we are very happy that uh, the third government-to-government -government project that we have with China uh, is precisely on this theme. This is the China-Singapore Chongqing uh, Demonstrative Initiative on Strategic Connectivity. And the base of operations is in Chongqing. But the project itself focuses on four areas that we think will contribute to the Belt and Road very significantly. So this includes cooperation in the area of finance, cooperation in the area of aviation, in terms of transport and logistics, as well as Infocom technology. So we think that uh, this uh, partnership, I think, can generate a lot of very interesting demonstration projects. Um, the Chongqing Connectivity Initiative is one that we are working very hard on uh, currently. And we also uh, welcome Chinese companies that are looking to invest along the Belt and Road to work with Singapore as a platform for financing, particularly for infrastructure projects. And let's turn to our uh, speakers from international institutions. Uh, Mr. Zhang Tao first, and then Danny. I would like to um, start with um, three uh, remarks. The first remark I wanted to emphasize is that the Belt Road Initiative uh, holds a very important uh, vision, um, that is to connect economies around the world. Um, so in, uh, in a sense that the key words uh, to me are openness and uh, connectivity. The bottom line is that the BRI, the, or Belt Road Initiative, has the potential uh, to strengthen cross-water dialogue and foster multinational um, cooperations. And to many of us, this is very important in today's increasingly interconnected world. Um, and this is, uh, we should say, even more important than ever uh, in, the, in, the, in the next few years and decades. Um, the second remark I want to say is that the um, um, now the question is how to best and fully uh, reap the benefits um, of this Belt Road initiatives. Um, from the IMF uh, perspectives, uh, two issues are critical. Number one, we will try to get microeconomic policies right in the first place. Why? Because right ma macroeconomic policies means a sound and stable policy environment that will help and strengthen business confidence, foster business activities, and support demand for cross-border business transactions. Make sure all, all of these uh, infrastructure uh, projects are uh, financially viable or that the recipient countries uh, have adequate institutional and management capacities uh, to manage them. So these are very much important. So the third and final remark I would like to, uh, to make is that we at the IMF um, has shown over many decades that the, uh, we can act as a catalyst for investment. 
And of course, we provide our policy advice. We provide financial resources. We also provide capacity development through our training and uh, technical assistance. And just uh, last month, um, we work uh, closely with the uh, People's Bank of China. Uh, we made an announcement at the uh, uh, Belt Road Forum in May that we established a uh, new China IMF capacity development center. And uh, we, our hope is um, by working with our memberships, including, uh, of course, countries like China uh, and Singapore, Pakistan, and so forth uh, around the regions, um, we will try to uh, maximize the benefits of this uh, Belt Road initiative. Thank you, Zantao. Danny. What is the relationship between the AIB and One Belt, One Road? Well, alongside five other uh, multilateral development banks, uh, at the Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation in May, we signed a memorandum of understanding uh, with the World Bank, with the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the ADB, uh, and others to cooperate on implementing the Belt and Road Initiative. And so there is a natural alignment between the AIB and the One Belt, One Road. We're partners. But turning to your question about partnerships to implement these visions, let me just suggest uh, three. Firstly, of course, and obviously, it requires partnerships between countries. In the AIB's case, we were set up with 57 founding member countries. Uh, during the course of this year, we've agreed to admit 23 more members, including some in Latin America and Africa, as well as in Asia and Europe. Um, so there will be 80 members within the uh, institution, and that's particularly important where you're considering cross-border investment projects. Secondly, partnerships between international financial institutions. From the AIB's point of view, we've already co-financed many projects with the World Bank, with the ADB, uh, uh, and others. We have very similar standards in terms of environmental and social and procurement uh, policies. But also the partnership is crucial to implement global, the gl global agreements. For example, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. All of the members of the AIB remain committed to the Paris Agreement, and sustainable infrastructure is a very high priority for our bank, uh, and indeed uh, crucial, I think, for all the countries to ensure green growth in Asia. And then lastly, uh, let me say, the partnership with the private sector is absolutely crucial to making a success of these strategies. According to some recent work by McKinsey, the financing gap for infrastructure in Asia over the next 15 years, $21 trillion. Th that is beyond the capacity of uh, of governments, of international financial institutions uh, alone. And so uh, mobilizing private sector investment for infrastructure in Asia will be absolutely uh, crucial. Uh, and so uh, mobilizing private sector resources is a key strategic objective for the AIB and for other international financial institutions and for many governments uh, uh, in the region. And it should be a key part of One Belt, One Road as well. And as, thank you. Thank you, Danny. Um, Minister Iqbal, you just mentioned the China-Pakistan economic corridor. It's, it's, a, it's a giant project. And I would argue that it also embodies um, the whole initiative. There are a lot of hope, there are a lot of benefits, but also a lot of challenges. The, the corridor travels a lot of area, a challenging area, challenging terrain. So. What could be done to push this project even further down the road? I think uh, when you implement a project of this size, there are a number of challenges which have to be addressed. And I would say that there are actually many gaps that uh, we have to proactively address. First and foremost uh, is the coordination gap, because when you undertake an initiative of this size, there is uh, a coordination not only of stakeholders within the country, but also with the external stakeholders. So we have a very strong steering mechanism through which we coordinate uh, with external and internal stakeholders. And over the last uh, two years, we have had over 50 ministerial meetings, which I chair, and through which we are able to cut through the red tape and uh, into, uh, the, the challenges of coordination amongst different ministries. So that is one very important element. The second uh, gap is the knowledge gap uh, that does not uh, uh, allow many local businessmen to also 
fully appreciate the opportunities that will come. So we have adopted a very proactive approach of partnering with the local chambers uh, to create a greater awareness about the opportunities that exist. The third gap, I would say, is the human resource gap that we also have to address, that while these opportunities come through infrastructure projects, through energy projects, you require different kinds of skills in the market, and they are not there. So we have very proactively now beefed up our skill training programs, the human resource development programs, so that this can be smoothly executed. And lastly, I would also like to emphasize it's not just the economic links, it is also people-to-people -people links that as a result of this initiative are giving us new opportunities. For example, Chinese language has now become the most important, second most important, <laughs> and the most sought after language program in Pakistan. So it is, you know, a fashion everyone wants to learn Chinese language. We have the highest number of students now in China probably after any other country. Uh, which have come here for a, a studying Chinese language. We see that there is a fusion of Chinese and Pakistani cuisines which is taking place uh, with uh, more Chinese workers there and Pakistani people coming here. So this people-to-people, -people, I think, uh, dimension is also very important. Financial coll collectivity is a very important part of the initiative. And, but along the Belt and the Road countries, they are actually at very different stages of financial sophistication and development. So what kind of innovation in, in finance arrangement are needed to promote the financial connectivity and the financial inclusiveness among these countries? John first, and then Danny. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, let me first uh, say that um, Financial uh, connectivities is one of the main uh, pillars um, of the uh, Belt Road uh, initiatives. Um, there are a couple of reasons behind it. Uh, let me explain a, a little bit from uh, my uh, perspectives. The first one is the, uh, the uh, we all know that greater um, uh, intra and inter regional um, linkages uh, among financial institutions. Um, and capital markets are necessary uh, or are necessary conditions for developing um, a growth supportive uh, uh, trade sector. So in a sense, is what for the trade uh, sectors, uh, this is, this is a, uh, the necessary conditions. Um, and second, the enhanced financial uh, connectivity can promote cross-border investment and increase financial market liquidities uh, reduce the cost of capital and improve uh, capital allocation. So these are the how the market uh, mechanism works. Uh, so uh, uh, so most of the people understand that. Uh, more importantly, uh, coming to uh, a spec that if you have a strengthened uh, financial uh, connectivities uh, through technology, for example, through fintech, um, we have observed in most recent years that can promote financial inclusions. Um, here, so uh, come to the, uh, the the question you 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 raised. Uh, how we can uh, we can do it? Uh, this is uh, uh, will improve the uh, uh, the provisions of the access to financial services for those people who normally uh, cannot have these uh, financial services, so-called unbanked populations, uh, in many of the developing countries uh, along the uh, belt uh, and road. Um, and, and of course, we can you know, explain a little bit more um, uh, how that can be happened. Um, for example, uh, we normally find that the access to uh, cross-border payment technology and the payment system has been approved for particularly low-income household. So, um, and, and of course, if people can work together uh, by putting in place the financial literacy programs to those uh, you know, normally unbanked population, that will also help them to get access to financial services. And of course, um, you see many countries nowadays, not only in you know, this area, but also in Africa, um, uh, Tanzania, 
uh, the uh, uh, Uganda, uh, Kenya, um, they all have this, uh, you know, uh, quite rapidly developed so-called mobile uh, banking uh, uh, system. So these are the things uh, which increase people's, you know, confidence that the uh, can can help uh, to 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 reach the uh, better and stronger financial inclusions. Thank, Thank you. you, Danny. Thank you. Um, let me just make uh, two points. The first is that for developing countries in Asia, there's an opportunity to leapfrog from established or old-fashioned technologies to the more modern ways of, of dealing with financial connectivity, financial inclusion, and in many other aspects of life as well. Uh, from a personal point of view, I moved from the UK to China a year and a half ago. Since then, I barely carry cash in my pocket because almost everyone accepts WeChat as a means of payment as most of the Chinese people in this room would know. That is much more sophisticated, actually, than the payment systems we have in the UK or in other uh, uh, European countries. Um, and th that's an example of how leapfrogging to more modern technology, exactly as, as, as was being, being said, can also help to promote financial inclusion. It can provide people with a way of uh, m making payments that are free of uh, risks of fraud or bribery and, 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 and those sorts of difficulties, as, as well as just being easy to, easy to use. From the AIB's point of view, we're obviously a project finance uh, institution, and so our interest in this comes from that uh, perspective. But certainly, if you're looking to try and attract private sector investment to infrastructure projects in, uh, in, 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 in many countries, particularly those countries that have very little capacity to absorb debt in the, in the public sector, then really private capital mobilization is the only way to, 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 to deliver the, the infrastructure that, that you need. And that requires a number of things. It requires good, well-structured uh, projects, which, as, as the Minister Iqbal was saying, requires capacity building in many, uh, in, in, in many uh, places. It requires stable policy frameworks so that investors have some confidence that things uh, won't change under their feet after they've decided to invest in a project. It may require, in some cases, some degree of political risk insurance. That's one role that a multilateral development bank can, can play as being part of the financial uh, structure uh, of, a, of a project. And just to say, from the AIB's point of view, uh, we're still an institution in our relatively early stage of thinking on, on, on this matter. We're working very closely with the private sector to try and determine what are the most useful, way, what's the most useful roles that our institution can play? What are the right products that we can develop to really help to encourage more private sector investment into infrastructure in developing countries in Asia and across uh, not just the One Belt, One Road, but, 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 uh, but far beyond? But with the idea that in the end, if infrastructure could become seen as a tradable asset class, then that would help to encourage much greater levels of private sector investment. Thank you, Danny. We are talking about innovation, but to be honest, no innovation will have meaningful impact without first, think, first thinking about uh, policy coordination among countries first. So I have a question for two ministers. So just give me your wild thinking. How do you envision, in, how do you envision the future innovation in this area, this policy coordination among different governments in the Belt Road Initiative. Uh, Minister Sim first, please. And um, make uh, innovations in terms of transport and logistics. And I think this is one way in which we can strengthen the content of Belt and Road. So uh, at the same time, uh, we are already seeing a very good um, uh, progress in terms of the aviation uh, links as well as the financing links that are coming out uh, from this particular project. And um, just to respond to the points that Mr. Zhang Tao and uh, Sir Danny was, uh, making, were making about financing, uh, indeed, um, we think that uh, to make financing for infrastructure very successful, you need to have a combination of um, very uh, good knowledge of the markets uh, along the Belt and Road. Uh, you need to have expertise uh, that are able to help assess risks uh, and also to bring together various financing uh, partners and also, um, hopefully, a good co uh, collaboration network with our multilateral development banks. And uh, these are the factors uh, that uh, Singapore hopes 
uh, will be able to uh, present a very compelling case for investors that wish to engage in infrastructure, uh, infrastructure financing as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Thank you. Minister Iqbal, please. Well, I would say that in terms of implementation and how to uh, uh, innovate for good, uh, speedy results, first and foremost, I think, is what holds true for any change management success. It is the ownership and support of the top leadership. It is absolutely necessary that the highest level support and ownership should be very visible and clear. In our case, it is the Prime Minister who has been personally championing the program, has been supervising, and at the ministerial level, I champion it. And that makes it very easy to break the red tape and put things on a fast track. The second important lesson from our experience is that governments have their limitations. Governments alone cannot undertake such big uh, uh, projects. So we have to open up and uh, provide opportunities for, our, for, for, our, for private sector, for our ac academia, research institutions, uh, for uh, civil society to also come in. And how can we create these collaborative spaces uh, where uh, we can pick up the brains from different uh, uh, sectors and have a collective wisdom uh, to uh, really maximize the value? Uh, I would also say that we also need to come out of the old uh, uh, straight jacket of looking at it as some kind of a development, cheap, concessional financing mode. There are many opportunities which can be done on a very commercial basis. For example, Pakistan had an energy policy uh, for many years and people were reluctant to come there. We were facing 16 to 18 hours of power shortages. And what CPEC has done, it has connected Chinese investors with the Pakistan's energy policy, we have billions of dollars coming in where the investors are making, making decent 17% return over equity. And we are getting oxygen in shape of uh, foreign direct investment that is helping us overcome energy crisis. So, uh, you know, how can we uh, harness the private sector investment? How can we connect the opportunities with the external financing sources? Uh, so it should not just be seen as some kind of a development uh, project which will require government-to-government -government intervention only. I think there are many opportunities which can be harnessed by connecting uh, markets uh, with the external financing in uh, private sector mode and public-private partnership mode, and that will give uh, more value. We have heard so many um, insights, ideas, good ideas, and visions from our fellow speakers. But you are different. You are a businessman. You are result driven. In a way, you are a customer to the whole initiative. So what would you ask for? What kind of concrete results, one, two, three, you ask for coming out of this initiative in the not so distant future? Thank you. So uh, let me be the voice of customer. Uh, I'm not necessarily the big multinationals who are well represented at the World Economic Forum already, uh, but the voice of the SMEs. I think Premier Li yesterday in his opening speech gave us an astonishing number. Every year in China only 3 million SMEs are being established. For an SME to grow, uh, you would like to have access to, access to the global market. And to have access to the global market, you need to grow. And growth requires capital. And I think uh, we have a number of people in the panel that can speak to that. The last thing you want to have as an SME is to have your working capital tied into inventory let alone into in-transit inventory. So uh, my request would be to ensure that with the Belt and Road Initiative and the partnerships that are established or will be established, uh, that we continue to serve the interests of the SMEs. It would be a shame if we have all this infrastructure being established, uh, creating fast access into countries like Pakistan or Singapore, and then seeing goods stuck at borders. So. For me, uh, the request would be to combine both infrastructure with trade facilitation. Only when we combine the two will be successful in the future.